You are listening to the Keeping It Juicy podcast. Your main squeeze in nutrition. Don't forget to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for a brand new episode. Also, don't forget to add us on Instagram and Facebook at Keeping It Juicy Podcast. All right, welcome back to our show. Uh, Today is episode 82 and it's called The Indigenous Truth. So we'll definitely dive more into what we mean by that in just a second. But before we do, let's start off with our new nutrition in the news for this week. So our new nutrition in the news is very, very controversial to say the least. So the title of the article is People with High Cholesterol Should Eliminate Carbs, Not Saturated Fat, apparently according to the study, which we'll attach in the show notes. But basically an, an international team of experts on heart disease and diet says there's no evidence that a low saturated fat diet reduces cholesterol in people with familial hypercholesterolemia. That's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. So for decades, people diagnosed with this condition, this condition have been instructed to minimize the consumption of saturated fats to lower cholesterol and reduce the overall risk for heart disease. But a new study was published in the Journal of BMG, Evidence-Based Medicine, and it found that there was no evidence to actually support these claims. And they actually followed up by saying a low-carb diet is more effective for, for people at increased risk of heart disease, such as those who are overweight, hypertensive, and diabetic. And their findings were actually consistent with another paper recently published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which actually provided strong evidence that food that raises blood sugar, such as bread, potatoes, and sweets should be minimized rather than tropical oils and animal-based foods. I feel like there's some truth to this. Like, mm-hmm. granted, like, for example, if you have a lot of simple sugar, that is mm-hmm. going to help raise your cholesterol in general Mm -hmm. absolutely i'm not entirely convinced by the saturated fat i mean these are only just the two recent studies i and let's also not forget that these are the only two nutrients that they're looking at either i mean what about increasing fiber that is not mentioned at all um and we know that fiber content can help keep your cholesterol at bay as well right um this study didn't look at that. Mm-mm. And it, like you mentioned, what type of sugar and is there any fiber with that as well? You know, our mm-hmm. processed sugars where there's absolutely no fiber with it whatsoever. And mm-hmm. then it is mixed with, you know, hydrogenated oils. I don't know, think a Snickers bar type thing, right. <laughs> you know, where you've got the high sugar, no fiber, high saturated fat, or something like fruit and I don't know, yogurt, where you've got saturated fat, but you have sugars and you have fibers as well metabolically mm-hmm. very very different foods mm-hmm. so it's just uh i feel like it's a give and take article so obviously like we said we attach it in the show notes but it's just interesting uh, that these two articles came out there's always some shit that's going to come out that's mm-hmm. going to seem controversial to the initial yeah, it's advice. been controversial you know since day one it's um, like people magazine you never know what's true just kidding right So a very controversial topic, um, which is going to lead us into another controversial topic for the day. Um, So if you haven't guessed by now, we are going to be talking about Indigenous people and just some of the issues that they face and the health conditions and disparities that come along with that. Mm -hmm. But before that, let's just define what Indigenous actually means, um, because it might be different than when you hear the word, what you think it is. So for the purpose of this episode, this is what indigenous means. So it's estimated that there are more than 370 million indigenous people spread across 70 countries worldwide. Practicing unique traditions, they retain social, cultural, economic, and political characteristics that are distinct from those of the dominant societies in which they live. Spread across from the Arctic to the South Pacific, these descendants, according to a common definition of those who inhabited a geographical region at the time of when people of a different culture or ethnic groups arrived to that geographical area. Uh, The new arrivals later became dominant through conquest, occupation, settlement, or other means. (laughs) 
<laughs> quote unquote other means. <laughs> so basically, yes, it's the people that were living there before the other group came in and fucked shit up. Uh, so among indigenous, <laughs> among the indigenous peoples um, are those of the Americas, for example, Lakota in the U United States, the Mayans in Guatemala. So the Aymaras in Bolivia, so the Inuit and the Aleutians of the Circumpolar region, and the Sami of Northern Europe, and the Aborigines and the Torres Strait Islanders of the Australian and the Maori of New Zealand. Forgive me if I butchered any of those words or names. Try my best. <laughs> These are the most popular indigenous peoples have retained distinct characteristics, which are clearly different from those of other segments of national platforms. So from there, let's go into what we mean by the indigenous truth. So in case you don't know, which I don't know how the fuck you don't know, like you, you have to live in a very small world to not know who your neighbors are. So we're talking about the reservations around you. So obviously, if you don't know, reservations have different interactions with food than what you and I would have um, in regards to us going to the market or we have farms nearby, but on the reservations, it's different. So there is a loss of plant-based plant food diversity and subsequent changes in dietary patterns closely associated with higher intake of more hyper-processed and calorically dense foods. And they have partly contributed to the rapid rise of diet and lifestyle-linked non-communicable chronic diseases, or NCDs, across different communities worldwide. The NCD health challenges linked to reduced traditional plant-based food diversity have been particularly acute for these indigenous populations who have witnessed the most significant losses in their traditional foods and non-food resources and have been forced to adapt to non-traditionary dietary patterns. I wonder how. But <laughs> globally, modern contemporary diets do offer more diversity in terms of plant-based food sources. However, restricted access and affordability of plant-based foods such as whole grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables, and the associated health benefits is a major, major food and nutritional security challenge for impoverished populations populations overall. Such restricted access to healthy food choices, along with other socioeconomic burdens ranging from loss of land to lack of economic opportunities to psychological trauma from, col from colonization, have substantially contributed to the worsening of NCD-linked health disparities between indigenous and non-indigenous people. So the occurrence of chronic diseases varies widely among different indigenous tribes over, overall. However, NCD-linked reduced lifespan is prevalent across most indigenous communities just worldwide. So most public health reports from the last two decades have actually suggested that Native American communities and Alaska Natives of the United States are facing increased health challenges due to the NCD-linked epidemic of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which this is not the first time I've heard about this. I've been hearing about this for a while. And a National Diabetes Statistical Report of 2017 indicated that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease among the Native American population is 16.5% 16, 16 higher, and the average life expectancy is 5.2 years less than other races and ethnic groups in the United States. That's a big fucking difference. I mean, prevention and management strategy, strategies to combat these disease epidemics need a systems approach overall with a solid foundation in ecological, cultural, social, and economic framework and an understanding of the health disparities and solutions from indigenous community perspectives, which if you listen to our previous episodes, we, we touched upon food deserts. We've touched upon health disparities. I mean, this is kind of leading into what we're talking about today a little bit. And if you don't know what we're talking about, go back. <laughs> we have plenty of episodes on it. Yeah. So yeah, that kind of just leads us into the issue of access to food on the reservations. So as mentioned, uh, many Native Americans are plagued by, plagued by diseases presented through poor diets, most specifically diabetes in all ages and actually obesity in children 
is a big issue as well. Um, and the diabetes rate of native population are more than double that of the white population. And many Native American families grapple with affording a wide variety of food to get the nutrition that they need. So not only is there um, obesity, um, diabetes, there's also potentially you know, nutrient deficiencies too because they don't have access to the wide variety of food that we need. And this reality is widely referred to as food insecurity, affecting one in four Native American families. And it is not helped by many of the food commodities that are provided to members of federally recognized tribes by the U.S. government under their treaty obligations. So that's a big problem. So these commodities are generally high in fats and carbs and sugars. Uh, these elements basically help contribute to the obesity and diabetes in native countries. Making matters even worse, uh, grocery stores are hard to come by in these remote and isolated areas that are often allotted to Native Americans. So the U.S. government does provide monthly supplies. Go the government. <laughs> Just kidding. But these reservations stay in pov poverty and are dependent on outside forces for food. So whatever the government's sending reservations is one... Sending very, shit food. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's extremely low quality and it's contributing to disease. So where are they supposed to get their healthy foods that should compromise the majority of their diet. Right. They're forced to travel long distances. Right. And sometimes and, that's not easy to do. And someone, someone is going to argue, well, a lot of them have casinos, so they're rich. Okay, that's only like 1% of all reservations. Well, don't quote us on that, but it's but, <laughs> not very many. I mean, they, they no. get that reputation, but that's also not everyone who lives on the reservation. And, no. you know... That's also like, okay, maybe those that have run casinos, they kind of found a loophole. But the other ones, like, what about the majority of people? Mm -hmm. it's, it it yeah. doesn't help. Yeah. So we actually found an interview with a member of the Souks tribe, and he states that a lot of our food does come from stores like a Walmart super center, and you have to save up enough for a ride into town you fill up the back of a truck with cheap food and head back to the reservation. So that is how a lot of um, members get their food. They, again, have to travel long distances to get to something like a Walmart. We all know what's in Walmart. Um, yes, there are some Walmarts that have the fresh produce section, but the majority of it's not. And the problem is likely worst on America's largest reservation, which is the Navajo Nation. Three quarters are food insecure, which is the highest rate in the country. And most people in this reservation eat from gas stations and like quick mart type places. There are only 10 grocery stores for an area the size of West Virginia. Imagine 10 grocery stores in the whole state of West Virginia. And yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, there are already, <laughs> there's so many issues with this. Well, we'll continue in a second, but I'm just thinking, so they're forced to move out, move out of their original land, and they go to this land, and they're already in shitty areas where they can't even food, their they can't even farm their original food, and the food that they are provided or, <laughs> or shitty food, and they're not giving the proper resource. So it's like an endless cycle of bullshit. Basically, like abuse. Like this is the land you're given. Where this is all you get because. You but know, it's not fucking land. Mm -mm. <laughs> mm -mm. Exactly. It was theirs to start with, and now they've just created. You know, this is your space. They can't. You know, farm like they used to. Yeah. And then okay, we're going to send you some food, but it's going to be crap. And then the amount of grocery stores on the reservation are far and few in between. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, 
I know that a lot of these reservations are already trying to find ways to combat food insecurity. I mean, we already we already talked about a lot of the issues. I mean, at least 60 reservations in the United States do, do have food insecurities. These food deserts offer more convenient stores and fast food restaurants and supermarkets and grocery stores, thus contributing to communities of people with poor diets and higher levels of obesity and diet-related diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. Like, we ta- like we've talked about with food deserts, that's an issue in itself. I mean, food deserts are heavily prevalent in a lot of these uh, native reservations. This is coupled with the reality that they have one of the highest poverty rates in the United States alone, and 30% of Native American children, just children themselves, live in that poverty. And therefore, these Native families are 400% more likely than any other U.S. household to report not having enough to eat, largely as a result of living in a remote, isolated location where food supplies and jobs are very scarce in the first place. And the commodities that they provide, (laughs) we just talked about it, is just bullshit. They're low in nutritional value and high in fats and carbs. And it just keeps, like, making this trend worse. What is so messed up about this situation is obesity is so prevalent, yet they report not having enough to eat. So it's this vicious cycle of Mm -hmm. like too many calories, yet not enough nutrients. It's almost that, that quote or saying that I've seen before. It says like half the world is trying to lose weight and half the world is starving. It's like, it's so messed up, like, right, and these obesity related diseases, yet you're undernourished, like, yeah, people people don't, richest countries, like, how is that possible? Right, and people don't understand, even if you are obese, like, if you're eating these foods, you're, you're going to be missing a lot of nutrients, just flat absolutely, you can Uh, be obese and malnourished, right, and there's a misconception about that Mm -hmm. whole topic Mm -hmm. in itself, Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. absolutely, um, I mean, we've already heard um, issues with obesity, but people don't realize uh, obesity is very prevalent in low-income households or impoverished households in the first place. So with that being said, the one of the upsides is there is this organization called the Partnership with Native Americans, and basically they, also known as PWNA, they combat food insecurity through immediate relief and long-term solutions that support healthy communities. This native-serving nonprofit is committed to addressing food ins- insecurity in the more than 300 reservation communities it serves across just 12 states. Um, so support from individual donors and organizations such as Walmart, <laughs> sorry. Walmart, um, and Newman's own foundation enables PWNA to directly support more community partners through the provision of healthy food, as well as gardening support and nutrition training. So they're trying to come out with this whole new system, which is fantastic. And the like we just said that Walmart may not have the best sources, but those that it sounds like this program is trying to give more fresh fruits and vegetables and whatnot that is higher in nutritional value. Right. So I certainly hope that they're focusing on those foods and not like Pop Tarts, you know? Well, (laughs) you know, hard to say. Mm -hmm. So Project or the Project Grow is a service of the PWNA and its Northern Plains Reservation Act, which is NPRA. And this program supports individuals and reservation programs taking the lead on healthy diets and nutrition education in their tribal communities. So a gardening movement in native country has inspired citizens to take on gardening as a solution to the lack of locally available fresh produce, all while gaining in self-reliance. So Project Grow has supported gardening through tilling of more than 500 individual gardens on three reservations. In keeping with its vision of self-sufficient native communities, PWNA also assists with grants, uh, seeds, and tools to help tribal community partners plant the seed for new garden projects. Through this support, community partners are able to integrate tradition and culture into their gardening projects, increasing community interest and engagement among the people while encouraging healthier lifestyles. 
So an 800 square foot garden can feed a family of four, creating direct access to healthier whole foods. PWNA tills and supports 10 or more community gardens on five reservations per year. This trickles down and benefits many families, ultimately helping to achieve each community's goal of increasing access to healthy food and addressing food insecurity. So PWNA also operates two mobile units for training and nutrition that enable Native American chefs and local cooks to collaborate on introducing fresh produce and healthier recipes in remote reservation communities. PWNA staff travel to individual reservations within the mobile units for training and nutrition to provide educational demonstrations and showcases on how to use locally available foods to create healthier menus. So great program that has been implemented into different reservations, um, right. but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Right, and that's only, that's what, that's not even, there's still like, I want to say hundreds more reservations like mm -hmm. that they haven't reached out to. So there's right. still definitely needs to be work done and mm -hmm. not just from this program in itself, but right. from everybody in general, mm -hmm. whether it be the local governments around it, um, on the federal level, like on the community level. Um, I feel like there just needs to be a lot of work. I know for a fact, that there was a bill that was trying to get pushed um, a couple of years back. I should follow up, but basically they were trying to push a bill to see if, like, <laughs> sorry, this sounds stupid, but I thought, okay, the school, the national school lunch program, I thought national meaning in every school. Little did I know that didn't meant the reservations. So there's no, proper school lunch program there, which kind of sucks, unless it completely changed. But that bill, there was a bill, I forgot the name of it, but it was supposed to enable those schools on the reservation to have that same program. So those, so those kids um, can have access to that school lunch program. Yeah. So I, I, I'll, I'll have to follow up, but I remember, I remember it being pushed through, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis or push towards pushing it for. Like it wasn't very supported? It was supported, but it wasn't like everybody was 100% behind it. There were yeah. people like, well, we'll see kind of thing, which is kind of, I, I guess like with the bill, they attach a lot of things with it, which I mm -hmm. understand to that degree, but I feel right. like... The, this should have There's already been weird happening. things that you know you think you're not agreeing to and somehow you're agreeing to it like right and i feel like this whole national school program should have already been effect for those that are on reservations because schools that are part of the school lunch program also receive some money from the federal government as well to help mm -hmm. facilitate that mm -hmm. um, so that's just something yeah that let's I follow up on that yeah, you know, but but I hope you guys kind of understand where we come from, where we're coming from, um, as we go through these series. I don't know how to describe it about food deserts and health disparities because it's a big deal and it's happening even in, in the wealthiest country, as a certain president would say. <laughs> you know, but. but I feel like these communities should not be forgotten. And if you live near one, mm -hmm. please do your best to help out. I know I don't particularly live close enough to one to actually do anything, but I know there's programs online that you can donate to. Mm -hmm. And um, we might actually attach a couple as well in the show notes, but. And I do think this topic gets forgotten about. Um, sometimes you could argue you know it's kind of on purpose too like what they teach kids in schools i didn't realize how poorly native americans were treated on their reservations until i got old enough to actually do my own research you know as a kid who grew up you know taking u.s history courses and whatnot like right. you know they don't paint the picture how it was and who which is expected whatever right but i don't think it's talked about enough so that it gets like thrown under the rug sometimes right and who knew history books 
actually a lot of people by now you know that history books have bias in themselves so, oh my gosh like, so biased it's but horrible and it's like that's what I was being taught as a child and now that I'm you know older coming it's to like realities. are you kidding me like right. brainwashing right literally well, some people would say whitewashing but that's a topic for another time yeah but, <laughs> Um, with that being said, let us know how you guys feel about this. What are you guys doing in your communities? Um, if you guys even knew about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you didn't, help. that's okay, too. As long as you know now, then that you, you can do something with that. <laughs> but with that being said, we want to close out the episode with our social media shout out of the week. And it goes to A. Adzwa. So A A D Z R A A, but basically she has a. <laughs> it kind of sounds like my name, but anyways, she has a bachelor of nutrition at IPB University, and she's from Indonesia. And oh, awesome! So uh, we appreciate the support. We see you, and it's always cool to see some international um, followers. So absolutely, so. yes. So, so thank you to your support and please send us a message and we can get your laptop sticker in the mail. And yeah, if you want to be our next social media shout out, like our stuff, send us stuff, comment on our stuff, all the fun stuff. All the fun shit. <laughs> fun shit. Yep. But as always, we're going to close out the episode. Don't touch nobody. Don't let anybody touch you. Stay safe. Because COVID is still out there, people. He's still out there going Alive crazy. Alive and well. <laughs> Even though some people think it's a hoax, but whatever. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning in. And if you want to be our next social media shout out, like our stuff, send us stuff, all the stuff. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Keeping It Juicy podcast. You mean squeeze the nutrition. Don't forget to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for a brand new episode. Also, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Keeping It Juicy Podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a review. Five stars, no less. On whatever platform you're listening to, or send us an email at keepingitjuicypodcast at gmail.com. Or if you have any topics you'd like for us to touch upon, shoot us an email. Until next time, don't do anything that I wouldn't do.